Hey, welcome back. Joe Gilder here. We're going to dive into another round of Mixed Together. If you don't have your tracks yet, there's a link below the video where you can get yours. So, to catch you up, if you've never seen any of this series, we're mixing a song together from start to finish. And this is, uh, we're still fairly early in the process. We've started doing some fun parts of mixing. We're doing some EQ and things like that. And uh, But it's still early. And so, as I talked about in the last video, I really want to listen to kind of what the mix is telling me and listen for things that are raising their hands still and kind of just keep addressing those until we get closer and closer to a mix we, we want. It may seem like a random way of approaching mixing, and it kind of is. Um, I feel like that's music is as much about being intentional as it is about reacting to what you hear. And um, I feel like I have a good combination of both. One thing that I'm probably going to start breaking out is, if you notice over on the right-hand side, I don't have my bus compressor on yet. We haven't really set that up. Uh, also, mix effects, which is a thing that's unique to Studio One that I want to show you uh, because it is a, f the, a, um, a feature or a uh, effect that a lot of folks use, whether it's you have Studio One and you use their console shaper or if you have, for example, one of the Slate plugins that emulates what a console sounds like. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second, but I'm not quite ready to turn that on just yet. So before I do all that, it's been a week since I've listened. I want to stop and listen and reorient myself and for you as well. So here we go. Let's listen to, let's jump over to the down chorus coming out of the solo into that final chorus. That's a good place to stop. So here's some things I'm hearing, and hopefully you were listening critically as well. By the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, listen. make sure you listen in HD. Uh, the actual the video quality improves, of course, but you may not know this. The audio quality is at its best at the highest HD level. So this will be uploaded. You can do 1080p if your internet connection can handle that. I highly recommend listening at that level. Um, at lower levels, it's just a lower quality MP3 encoding. So there you go. Uh, if you're on Facebook, same thing. Click the HD button. I, Facebook may have changed, but I think their audio quality, at least in the past year or so, has been not as great as YouTube. So if you're finding you don't hear things as well, switch over and find the YouTube version of this video. They're posted in both places. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what I'm hearing um, in this section, the bass feels a little loud. And it feels a little loud, more so like mid-range loud. I can it, it doesn't have the the deep low end that I kind of want, and, and and it just actually just feels a little loud. So I'm gonna actually just pull it down a couple dB, just because I know it needs to come down. And then I'll continue listening and see if it needs it'll need some more love and EQ wise probably. Um, the vocal is a little quiet. It's getting a little lost there in the chorus. That's uh, something to. It's 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 on my mind. It's not super important to me right now. Uh, there are other things I want to listen for. The drums still feel pretty basic. It's good, but I'd like it to really snap and pop and all those things. Um, but overall, the balance, other than those two things, so the vocal up and the drum and the bass down. I'll actually bring that vocal up a smidge now. Just let's just listen real quick. Something just raised its hand. I got to deal with it right now. It's on the vocal. Listen for that upper mid range piercing kind of sound. So much more to give. Might not be on the vocal. So much more to give I it's not. 
<laughs> so I like Solo. You'll hear me bash on Solo. I don't think you should do a lot of stuff in Solo because it's, I've made that point a million times. Do things in context. But listening here, when I sing the word give, it sounded like those that upper frequency that we talked about in the last video is popping out. And in the mix, that's what it sounds like. I got so much more to give. To get that kind of up in that frequency range sounded like it was cutting through a lot. Well, let's listen to the vocal there. It may be cutting through a little bit, but it sounds like it's coming from somewhere else, maybe the guitars. So I'm going to mute the vocal and listen to that. There's a little squeak in the guitar that's coming through there. Interesting. I think it's on the telly track. Okay, so chances are that squeak is there. Uh, chances are it's also in lots of other places because it's kind of a really overdriven, compressed sound. So let's go deal with that because that's going to poke through and make the vocal sound awkward. So that just raised its hand. So let's find it. I'll turn on auto EQ so it doesn't increase the volume and cut your head off. That seems right. Yeah, right there, that really whistles. When you find a frequency whistling, it's a good one to at least pay attention to. Maybe not necessarily cut, but let's cut it and see what happens. Okay, it's a little better. Uh, actually warmed up that tone a little bit, which I kind of like. And with the vocal, so a little bit better. It's not super great, but I'm going to see if another frequency on the vocal needs to be addressed. So so okay, so it, it may be the vocal after all. There's a little bit of that squeak that's coming in, but the vocal still got a frequency that's kind of whistling. So let's find that one. Annoying as this process can be. So much more to give than I could ever take. So much more to give than I could ever take. So much more to give than I could ever So that's in the key of the song. It's the note that I'm singing. Oops, I moved the wrong one. Um, But it is kind of ringing. You hear how it rings out pretty good? So much more to give. Great example. So I've been doing a lot of this and I've got, I talked about it, I think in the last video, go watch my Notch City video if you want to really get into notching and how important it is. But listen to how this frequency is just kind of resonating the entire time, the entire time. So the note is. No, it's more like. Cause I've got yeah, it's. <laughs> I know this is awkward. Which is, I don't have a piano guitar close enough. Uh, hold on. Um, no, hang on. That guitar's tuned funny. Hold on. See, I told you this is gonna be real and raw. Uh, here we go. So the song is in is in B, okay? Um, so the chord I'm playing right there is a B major. Um, but the note... It's an E, which is interesting. So what I'm singing is a D sharp. So I'm singing the third of the chord. I've got so much more to give. So I'm not singing an E. I sang an E there, the last note, but then I go, I, e -A, I got so much. So kind of that E note, or maybe it's a little bit in between, it's not necessarily a note, it's just, it's just a resonant frequency of the microphone, or the room, or my nasal cavity, I don't know, it doesn't really matter, it's not a super dire problem that can't be fixed here. 
um, with this EQ. So we find that frequency, which we already have. Let's just see what happens when we notch it out. So the point I wanted to make is listen to how we know that frequency is is resonating. But listen, it's not just resonating when I sing it. It's kind of there the whole time. Never see what's right in front of me. Cause I've got so, so it's a consistent note that's being just kind of it's just kind of floating in the room. Most likely, if I had to give my best educated guess, that was I even forget where I was when I recorded this. It was in my last studio. Um I think it was with that uh, Roswell audio mic, um, but could just be the way the room was laid out in the exact place I put that mic in the room, that that frequency was building up in the room a little bit and hit that mic in just the right way, or the way it bounced off my face. I don't know. That doesn't really matter. Obviously, having mixed this, I would go back and kind of be more aware of listening for this, because my voice tends to sound harsh in those upper mids, so if we can find a better mic to match it, uh, which like this SM7 does that really well. Um, or if we can find a better place in the room or a better positioning of the gobos around the microphone to minimize some of the bouncing around the room of the sound, that's all helpful. Now I know we're, how many minutes? We're 11 minutes into this video and all I've done is played you this really high frequency, but it's important. This is one of those things that you absolutely will, it absolutely will apply to a mix that you're working on or that you will work on this year. Um, whether it's vocals, which that happens a lot, I find it pretty common in vocal, but also guitars, um, some electric and definitely acoustic, depending on the nature of the room, there'll be some ringing. Drums is the same thing. There's a lot of ringing that's happening. And as we mix and we blend everything together, that ringing is going to stay and blend and make things muddy or indistinct or weird. And you may not know how to fix it. This is one way, or at least the best way I've found thus far in my life to fix it. So let's take care of that frequency now. Never see what's right in front of me. Cause I got so much more to give than I could ever take. It's really interesting. So I will play it and I'll just, you'll see me click on and off that band of EQ. Uh, I'll click right here. Listen to kind of that. You can hear that frequency come in and out. It's like we're adding in harmonics somehow. Here we go. Never see what's right in front of me Cause I've got so much more to give than I could ever take It's pretty subtle, but I think by doing that we've taken care of that thing I heard that raised its hand a second ago. Never see Yeah, it is that give doesn't cut out, cut through quite as badly. I'm gonna notch this a little bit more because it doesn't seem to be hurting the vocal. Still bothering me on this guitar though. Maybe we didn't quite have the frequency right. Let's try that one. Okay, that was a cool example right there towards the end. As I clicked it on and off, you could hear this whistle kind of come in and out. So that feels like that's the right choice. Uh, I changed the frequency a little bit. It made the guitar a little bit darker, but I think that's going to be okay. We can always come back in and boost this overall upper mid-range with that notch still there. That's totally allowed. Um, but for now, I'm happier with the way that all sounds. So we did some work on the telly. The telly and the vocal were sitting on top of each other. And if we were in mono, like we probably should be, uh, we could probably hear that a little more clearly. There, that sounds a lot better to me. Uh, the other thing is, we we obviously could go in and just edit out the squeak. That squeak's not... It, you could take it and turn it down, or we could just edit it out entirely. I'm not a big fan of that just because, A, this is rock. 
leave the stuff in there. If this was a really tight pop recording that needed to be just really, really pristine, then yes, I'd probably do more of that. But for something like this, I think those EQ moves work. Another solution on that Telecaster part could be maybe a multiband compressor with a pretty tight range in that frequency that's popping out where it just, when it when the squeak happens, it slaps it down. I've done that on different recordings, especially acoustic guitar where there's more fret squeak and things like that, and that tends to help. Okay, so I'm gonna listen. I wanna, I've, I've, I've zoomed in for a little bit here, thinking about the mix and listening to it. I wanna zoom back out both literally and figuratively and get my bearings again. So I've, I've been in squeak land. That's all I'm going to hear for a while if I don't stop and kind of regroup. So let me go back and just listen and see what next is raising its hand. If nothing is, I'm going to do a little bit of bus processing and then kind of get back at it. Okay, feels pretty good. Um, I like the vocals better. It's still not perfect. There's still some upper mids that bother me a little bit, but one of the things I tend to do with vocals is a lot of times I'll leave it alone until the very end and get all the instrument stuff in place. So you may see me over the next few videos just mute out the vocal entirely. <laughs> work on the instrumental. If, to me, it's easier to, right now, all these things we did, I think are good and necessary, but um, the vocal still needs some EQ, but also tend to, this, this may seem, seem weird and sacrilegious even, um, I don't see the vocal as that important tonally to the mix. It's, it's important, it's important, it's important, um, but I feel like of everything in the mix, of everything we're listening to, the vocal is the only thing that doesn't, one of the only things that isn't playing the entire time, right? We're always listening to guitars, we're always listening to bass, drums, the keyboard for the most part. So the vocal just comes in and then stops, which is typical of most songs, right? So what I really need is for, you know, you, talk, you hear people talk about carving out space in a mix for different things. I don't know what that really means. Um, I understand it, like conflicting frequencies and things like that. But for me, I don't really want to carve out space in the mix for my vocal in a, in, a, in a very like nerdy, intentional way. Um, I want my instrumental mix to sound amazing and then I want the vocal to layer on top of that and work well. And what I found most of the time is focusing on the mix to sounding amazing, I can then kind of finagle the vocal to fit on top okay. The vocal, can you can take away a good chunk of frequencies. Um, you can do some pretty aggressive compression and it tends to take it pretty well, especially in rock music like this, um, to where by itself the vocal might sound thin and weird, but on top of a big, thick rock and roll mix, it works. So that's kind of what I'm thinking here. Uh, the vocal certainly needs a little bit of work, but I'm not gonna focus too much on that right now because overall, instrumentally, I'm digging where this thing is going. The next thing I wanna do uh, is deal with some of the, at least do this console shaper. So let me introduce this real quickly. This is something, if I had done this series a couple years ago, I would not have done this. And I'm still on the fence about how much I like it or not. So the idea here is Studio One, which is the software I'm using, uh, re rolled out this feature. It's kind of a separate plug-in system that they've developed uh, called Console Shaper. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's in the category of mix effects. So it's in a different place than the normal plugins. And it applies more globally to the entire mix. And the idea is it emulates some of the sound that you get from going through a nice analog console. You've probably heard of Stephen Slate, Virtual Console Collection. Waves has a bunch of them. And lots of people have these plugins. I've never really bothered with them. I certainly haven't spent any money on them. Because to me, they're more 
there are other things I can do, like what we've been doing in these videos, that have a much bigger, more dramatic effect on the mix than some subtle console shaper thing will do. And I don't think a console shaper is the thing that's keeping you from good mixes. If your mixes aren't good, getting something that emulates a really good sounding console, it might bring some improvement. It's not going to be the thing, the miraculous, you know, savior of your mixes. It'll help a little bit. To me, improving you is what's going to make your mixes better. Getting good at hearing things, balancing things, EQing things, that type of thing. That said, this is a pretty interesting uh, little plugin. So when I turn it on, it's got noise, which is, I think, a ridiculous setting. You hear that? Brings up literally kind of the white noise of running through a bunch of electronics. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I've used it before. You know, honestly, in a big mix, I've used it and turned it up. And during the loud parts of the mix, I do hear a little bit of difference. But like the fade out, it's just so hissy. I just don't, I don't like that as much. So I tend to leave that alone. Crosstalk is the idea of, on old consoles, the, uh, the vocal channel would bleed into the adjacent channels just a little bit. The electronics were close. It would just bleed a little bit. And um, that can be a part of the sound. It can kind of glue things together a little bit. So sometimes I leave it on just a little bit. I, I've, I've done it way up before, but it, the mix started to get a little out of hand. It almost started to sound a little more mono because everything was bleeding into everything just a little bit. So I may leave that on or off. I feel like that's not that important. Over here is the one that matters to me the most. This is drive. So this is the idea of, you've heard people talk about probably taking a console and overdriving the inputs to get kind of a little, aggress a little aggressiveness, a little saturation, maybe even a little distortion. That's what this drive knob does. So it allows me to, usually I set it somewhere in here below six, and it just... It does something to the sound that thickens the low end a little bit, but it's not an EQ thing. It's like it adds a little bit of some harmonic content that makes things sound a little softer and a little thicker and a little punchier. Um, so when I tried it, that's what I heard, and that's kind of interesting. Now, when I crank it up, you'll actually hear on the loudest parts of the mix actual distortion, <coughs> which should be cool for a, a certain effect, a certain maybe style of song where it just needs to sound crazy, but I tend to just kind of do something like this. My one complaint with this version is when I do this, it makes things louder, and there's no way to adjust the output volume, so it's going to sound louder, so it's really hard to A-B this, but I'm going to turn it on anyway. So here it is. Here's my mix. We'll do the same section we were at before, um, and listen as I turn this up, what it does to the mix. It's going to get louder, but it's also going to change the tone of the mix a little bit. Okay, really, this is not a commercial for PreSonus, even though they have sponsored Home Studio Corner before. Um, they fixed it. So when you saw, when I turned this all the way up to 18, the volume stayed about the same. That's cool. So now we can hear the tonal changes. So thank you, PreSonus, for fixing that. Um, what I notice is when I get, you, you, it kind of goes from all the way off, everything's pretty clean sounding, all the way up, it gets really dark and oversaturated. To me, there's a spot somewhere in here where it gets a little thicker, a little nicer, but it doesn't get dull. I don't want it to get dull, um, but I do want it to help shape the mix a little bit. So let's find that spot one more time. Interesting. You'll notice, you may have heard that, uh, on the vocal especially, it's only turned up 4 dB, but the vocal is way less bright. There's way less kind of sibilance there, which of course we can handle with EQ and de -essers. We've done some of that already. But the big thing with digital systems and recording everything with nice, clear, clean microphones is you tend to get really clean tracks. And that's great, but all that cleanliness <laughs> 
can can amount to a lot of high frequencies that tend to make things sound a little bright, a little amateur, it loses a little warmth. Now you can roll off the highs with EQ, and it, it, that can help actually sometimes. But in this scenario, it's not rolling off the high end, but it's warming up the low end and adding in some harmonics of some sort of, and some saturation. I don't really understand it, and I don't think you have to. It's just making it sound a little warmer. I will not be fighting the vocal being quite that bright now because I've got some saturation just on the mix entirely. So the way this works, it's on my mix bus, but it's also processing on the individual channels as well. The buses, it's kind of acting like everything's going through a channel on a console, so you get this kind of global effect. Everything's being affected a little bit, which kind of adds up to overall. A little bit warmer sounding mix. So when I listen to that, I'm thinking about how now the guitars feel warm and thick, and now I feel like I have freedom to remove some of the low mids, maybe boost a little highs. I can boost some highs into this console shaper that's darkening things up, and it's going to do that in a way that's not super harsh. It's almost like the highest frequencies get kind of smacked around a little bit and softened and rounded a little bit, so everything's not quite as cutting, which for a song like this is great. Now, if you're doing a very clean orchestral thing, you probably don't want console shaper on, taking taking away some of the detail that you have. If you're doing a nice acoustic guitar, maybe even a folk project that needs to be, or, or more bluegrassy style, where everything needs to be nice and crisp and clean, then that might not make sense either. Or you might not want it to be making things quite as dark. But in this example, which again, remember, mixed together is me mixing through this one song, and you're going to see tactics that work on this one song. Variations of them will work on other songs, but this is a moment in time. These are the things that this mix took, which is why I wanted you to have the track so you can mix along with me. But, you know, this won't exactly apply on any other mix. So that's why I'm trying to speak in generalities and, and the thought process behind it, because then you can take those thought processes and apply them to your mixes. But that's interesting. That, to me, has taken the mix to a little bit better level, a little bit more professional, and it set me up to try something that I've been trying lately on the mix bus that I'm not ready to show you today. Uh, but next week, I'm going to do something differently here that, honestly, I'm a little nervous to do because some people are going to say it's wrong and I shouldn't do it this way. But I've been getting some interesting results, and I have an interesting thought process as to why I want to do that, which I've shared a little bit here and there, but I'll talk about that next week in the video. So in the meantime, if you are behind in this series, don't fret. The tracks are still there. You don't have to do this exactly with me as I go through it, but I would encourage you to go to homestudiocorner.com slash MT and sign up to get the tracks, download them, pull them into your session, and get working on your mix, because I think as you work through this and see me work through this, there'll be a lot of aha moments that you'll have, and those aha moments are going to make you better, and that's really why I want to do this. So thanks for watching. I appreciate you. If you have questions or comments, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. That's it for me. See you next week.